we're out there campaigning and it, it's hot out there and people are wondering, you know, how much hotter is it going to get? Uh, it was, I think two weeks ago, it got over 90 degrees in the Arctic. The ice is melting and instead of reflecting the heat back when there's ice and white, it's dark and it's ocean and it's absorbing the heat. And north of the Arctic Circle, we have forest fires going on now. Greenland, Siberia, Alaska, Canada, uh, Sweden. And this is unprecedented. And the thing that's scary is the tundra is starting to melt. And there's a place off Siberia where the scientists are now very concerned that there's gonna be what they call a methane bomb. Methane is 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide in heating up the atmosphere in the first 20 years. It's more potent because it has a shorter half-life, but even over a century, it's over 30 times more potent. If that methane goes off, we're really in trouble. And we're in a situation now where we are putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere 10 times faster than 252 million years ago when there was a mass extinction that uh, got rid of 97% of the species on Earth at that time. This is a life and death crisis that we're facing. So it's a really important topic that we're talking about tonight. 252 million years ago, they had super volcanoes and that's something we can't control. But the carbon dioxide and methane going into the atmosphere is caused by burning fossil fuels. So that's why probably the centerpiece of our campaign again, as in the last two campaigns, is we need to get to 100% clean energy by 2030. That's what the climate science says, industrial economies like New York have to do if we're gonna have any hope of keeping the rise in temperature below two degrees Celsius, uh, or if we get beyond that, these tipping points and the methane and so forth, and we'll be an accelerating global warming in a real crisis, the kind of crisis where we won't be able to produce enough food. People will have to leave the tropics, even a country like China, as well as India. Mass migration, do you think we have an immigration issue now? Just wait if we don't handle this climate crisis. So very serious topic today. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm gonna have Mark speak about this. We just found out that the uh, Democratic National Committee voted last week to reverse its decision not to take money from the fossil fuel interests. So they're going the wrong direction in the face of this crisis. So Mark, you wanna speak more about that? Well, a lot of the climate change groups, such as say Food and Water Watch, have made it a big campaign to try to get uh, candidates for public office to say that they will not take uh, any money from fossil fuel companies. Not surprisingly in New York State, it was Howie Hawkins and Mark Dunley who were the first two candidates uh, to make such a pledge. And some people may remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, a young volunteer for Food and Water Watch caught, um, who's that guy you're running against? Andrew Cuomo at one of his uh, fundraisers and they got him on tape saying, would you agree governor not to take, you know, funds from fossil fuels, and so of course, of course. And uh, by you know, next couple of hours, they were backtracking. Oh, I didn't understand what the young lady was saying. I thought she was asking me if I don't like fossil fuels, not if I would not you know, uh, agree not to take any money from the fossil fuel industry. And we saw that same thing, unfortunately, recently with the Democratic National Committee. It was a big, issue for a lot of the climate change groups, especially a lot of the uh, young millennial types. And so under pressure, uh, the Democratic National Committee uh, agreed to stop taking uh, fossil fuel contributions in order to try to appease their uh, base. But unfortunately, the fossil fuel companies and their allies in the labor unions, uh, you know, went to the DNC and said, hey, you know, fossil fuels are important for jobs and therefore you should be taking money from the fossil fuel industry um, in order to uh, create jobs. Even though the reality is nationwide, there's five times as many jobs in renewable energy uh, as there is in um, coal and oil. And one of the other things that came out of that DNC meeting is that they're back to the Obama, all of the above energy strategy. And Andrew Cuomo, I mean, this is astounding given that in going back to the 2010 campaign, 
we were arguing natural gas is not the bridge to the renewable future. Yet last year or earlier this year, he told that to the Buffalo News. And more recently, he said these nukes that we're bailing out to the tune of 7.6 billion are the bridge to the renewable future. These are dirty forms of energy, particularly natural gas. We now know actually contributes more greenhouse gas because of the methane than coal does. Yet he's presiding over the conversion of the Cayuga coal plant uh, around Seneca Lake to natural gas. And uh, it just shows that uh, the Green Party right now is the only party that's calling for 100% uh, clean energy and really means it. I think one of the things that needs to be pointed out is that there are two bills in the assembly to get to 100% clean energy. There's the one that we support and Mark Dunley, who I should say, after 28 years with the Hunger Action Network of New York State fighting poverty, has for the last five years devoted his energy to uh, fighting this climate crisis, which is gonna make us all poor if it, if it keeps accelerating. And uh, you know he's worked with 350.org and has his own green education and legal fund and has played a big role in writing the legislation now before the state legislature, the New York off bill, New York off fossil fuels will get us to 100% clean energy by 2030. It has benchmarks. It requires every uh, government in the state of 50,000 or more to have a climate action plan. It integrates them at the state level. There are benchmarks like no construction, no new construction after 2020 uh, can be, it has to be carbon neutral. By 2025, there can be no vehicles sold in the state that are not zero emissions vehicles. Uh, this is the kind of uh, crash program that we need to address this climate change. But what did the Democrats do? They go for uh, a bill that's much slower, 100% by 2050. And if you read the bill, you don't see how they're even going to get there by then. Uh, it's really a, a weak bill. The other bill that, well, let me just mention, okay. the other bill that you had a lot to do with is a carbon tax bill. Uh, one of the most robust uh, proposed in the whole, really the whole world. And those two bills are for the legislature and, and we're saying vote for the Greens. Like last time we got 5%, Cuomo had to compete for our votes and he went with a fracking ban, even though he's flooding the state now with imported frack gas. But it shows that our vote can make a difference. So Mark, you were gonna say something. Well, I just wanted to point out that the problem we see right with the Democratic National Committee reversing his position on taking money from the fossil fuel industry because some labor unions are concerned about jobs. We've seen that in New York State with some of the big money, big environmental uh, coalitions who feel it's really critical um, to appease the labor unions. And so for instance, one of the things a couple of years ago, this coalition, New York Renews, when it was starting, I, I will say they've gotten better because the grassroots has pushed them to get better. But at like their first meeting, they said, well, we want to have a victory early on on climate change in order to you know, empower people. And so I raised my hand and said, well, there's an easy victory coming up because it was defeated four years ago. We can defeat it again. It's already dead. They haven't announced it. And that was to stop the Port Ambrose liquefied natural gas proposal off of um, Long Beach. And they stunned me. They refused to oppose this particular project because there was a couple of unions who would get some jobs um, by building out these gas pipelines. Um, yes, we, we want a just transition. We want to make sure as we move away from fossil fuels that the communities and the workers personally employed or dependent upon the fossil fuels have their economic needs met, get job retraining, get first preference, for the millions of new jobs that can be created. But we can't allow the fossil fuel industry to continue to build out in order to maintain a few of these you know, dying jobs. Now we have a question from Sandy or a point, and she mentions that she's a retired union member on the state pension who would like to see clean green energy investment for my children and grandchildren's future. And, and so one of the things, a very simple thing we've been asking New York State to do is to divest our state pension plan, about $200 billion, uh, from the fossil fuel industry. We have somewhere between $6 billion or, or $12 billion. $6 billion is the low ball figure from the state controller, including over a billion dollars in Exxon. Um, since 350 started the campaign five years ago, we've managed to divest 
about $6.2 trillion worldwide from about 900 different institutions, including most recently the uh, nation uh, Ireland, and first nation to do it, um, but also uh, New York City has agreed to divest. And we don't think that the state should be benefiting from investing in the destruction of the planet, but it's also increasingly a bad financial risk as the world moves away from fossil fuels to clean energy, those funds already are beginning to lose money and we should move out of them. Next question from Steven says, the silence from democratic candidates and elected quote unquote progressives is deafening. And Stephen, I think it's worse than that. I, I'll go back to this Climate and Community Protection Act. It is not up to what the science says we must do. And unfortunately, the Democrats who do want to say they're on the side of fighting climate change are getting behind this bill, including Cynthia Nixon. And it's really disappointing and I think unforgivable because I know Food and Water Watch and others have talked to her about the New York off bill. And she's sticking with the Climate and Community Protection Act, I think because that's what the Democratic leadership decided they would go for. 2050, most of these elected officials will be long gone. They're not gonna have to live with the consequences of this uh, irresponsible bill that they're supporting. So yeah, the silence is one thing, but the misdirection uh, and confusion is probably worse. Uh, we get it from Trump. It's disappointing to see that we get it from the Democrats who consider themselves the opposition to Trump. And w w one thing I'll add on, um, Howie mentioned earlier on that literally right now, over the last month, the Arctic Circle has been burning. Um, wildfires massive all over the place. Uh, and in Sweden, you know, one of the countries closest to the Arctic Circle, the climate change has now become the second most important issue in the election. It recently passed in the polls, uh, healthcare. Um, it hasn't risen to that level in the United States. Yes, the vast majority of people believe in climate change. They believe we need to take action, but they're not demanding action. But it, when the New York Times two weeks ago put out its entire Sunday magazine to the proposition that the planet is doomed, that we have met, we have missed our opportunity to stop catastrophic climate change, people argued about their analysis as to um, the reasons why we missed the opportunity. But surprisingly, very few people argued against the proposition that the planet is doomed. And you would think if we actually have people now seriously talking about the possible extinction of human beings as a species within the next century, that might get some of these politicians and even some Democrats a little bit more riled up. So Terrence has a question about using kinetic wave flotillas on the Great Lakes to generate energy. He asks, are you familiar with this offshore power source? I hadn't thought about it in terms of the Great Lakes. I've thought about it in terms of the ocean uh, where you know waves are really a derivative of solar power. The solar, the sun, that energy generates the winds which generate the waves. And it's a clean source of energy. Um, I hadn't really thought about it on the Great Lakes. There are waves out there. Uh, so. You know, the question is, why not? I think there might be some people who have aesthetic questions. It might be a sighting issue. But the point, I think, is about renewable energy. It's all around us. The wind blows, the sun shines, the waves splash, the rivers flow. All this kinetic energy and direct solar energy is all around us. And all we got to do is build the technology to harvest it. And once we build out that technology, the marginal cost of getting more energy from that energy all around us is it's marginal it's near zero uh, so one of the things if we build out to 100 percent clean energy by 2030 the study by uh, economists and engineers and scientists at cornell and stanford uh, figured that electric rates would go down half of what they are now so this is not only a way to fight climate change it's a boon to our economy four and a half million jobs uh, electric rates in half and uh, you know, basically, a crash program will be, you know, the multiplier effect of all that investment and work will just the economy will be roaring, and everybody will have work. You know, I, you know, one area there has been a fair amount of research recently 
uh, has been tidal power. Uh, and of course, you get tidal power, you know, along the, the coast, but also big rivers like the Hudson River uh, has a lot of tidal power. And in one innovation they actually have started in the uh, Portland is they've been putting um, turbines, probably not quite the accurate name, um, to create hydroelectric in the pipes for the water system. So as, usually that's gravity fed. And so as the water comes down, it spins and, and creates electricity. And it's also, they found it's a good way for them to have something inside the tubes to actually monitor you know, leaks and deterioration. So there's a lot of innovative things that are coming about. We need to stop putting money into fossil fuels and put money into renewable energy. Like one issue we've been fighting about is the governor, Mr. No Fracking, after how he, you know, ran against the modern for five years, um, he may have banned the fracking of natural gas, but he is importing um, a tidal wave of frac gas into New York State. And one of the things he wants to do is he wants to put in a low-income neighborhood for a century. Has had a lot of pollution in order to. Uh, actually, in this case, creates steam to heat the Empire State Plaza, the state buildings. Um, he wants to now put in two more frack gas turbines, but burn gas from Pennsylvania. We're saying, you know, Oklahoma, an oil state, Colorado, another, you know, you know, big energy state, and Wisconsin, or, or I'm sorry, Michigan, have all started to heat their state capitals with geothermal issue. So why the governor continues to push uh, fossil fuels, um, you know, to heat the Empire State Plaza and the state buildings rather than renewable energy, you might think he's getting money from the fossil fuel industry or something. So next question, will pronouncements that we are already doomed risk more complacency and fatalism from politicians and the public? And the next question, does the ruling class have no sense of self-preservation? Yeah, I think you don't want to say we're doomed because then what's the point? Uh, we're in a serious situation and we can mitigate the problems that are already we're already seeing by taking action. So if we just sit back, it's going to get worse than if we take action. And does the ruling class have no sense of self-preservation? I think they're so rich, they think they can buy their way out of this. They can buy air conditioning. They can buy the food. The, the fact is that as things get worse, when climate change comes, food is scarce, the rich are going to be in a better position to claim what they want on the market. Uh, and their, the interest at the top of their mind is the next quarter's profits. So basically we can't rely on them. We've got to take action, take responsibility ourselves and make the changes we need to do rather than you know, beg them to do the right thing because they're not going to do it. Well, I mean, it's sort of two, well, there's three routes you can go. One is you go the extinction of human species, which kind of we don't think it's a good idea. Um, the, the, the second is the avenue we're following right now, which is build out more gated communities, create biosphere, you know, regulated um, living environments for the very wealthy, and they go and, and hide in there, and the rest of us are left to, you know, fight it out for reduced access to food and, 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 and for water. The third way, which is the green way, is to help everybody and to immediately transition to 100% clean energy. It will, you know, okay, it's less profits for the fossil fuel companies, but it's cheaper electric rates for us. It's healthier for us. It reduces the amount of air pollution. It's New York State is, is 5 million, you know, more jobs. And even the Pope has said, listen, the reason why we have economic exploitation, the reason why we have you know, the police who target, you know, people of color, you know, the racism is the same mentality that drives climate change. And we have to solve it all at once. We're either going to create a society which treats every individual as an equal, or we're going to continue our present path, which is, you know, how many billionaires own as much as the bottom 50% at this point? Uh, three millionaires own as much as the bottom 50% of America, I think, is the uh, statistic you're looking for. And at the global level, I think it's eight more than, oh, more than the 90% of the rest of the world. I mean, it's absurd. I mean, just in New York State, or take New York City, 
1980, 12% was the share of income going to the top 1%. Today, they get 41%. So imagine you have 100 pennies, a dollar, and the rich guy takes 41, and then to the other 99 people, he throws the pennies out, and they scramble to try to get one of those pennies. That's the situation we're in. It's extreme inequality, and the rich have detached from the rest of our society. They don't know what we're going through, and they really don't care. So like I said, we're gonna to have to take care of things ourselves. Uh, one of the things is this mentality, we gotta get rich. Let's talk about the woman who was running, uh, resisting the pension fund, Vicki Fuller, and she took a revolving door into one of these frack gas pipeline companies. You wanna say a few well, about Well, she was that? the chief investment officer for the state controllers. I mean, she was the top person who decides how we invest the $200 um, billion in the state pension plan. And she wants to invest in fossil fuels. She's been quite outspoken uh, against a divestment, whereas you know many people in the rest of the world are moving towards it. And she recently announced she was leaving the state controller's office. And when she left, she was appointed to the board of directors, which means a nice little you know bonus package for not, not much work, uh, to the Williams Company. And the Williams Company is one of the biggest um, builders of natural gas pipelines. People, particularly in New York City, probably know about the uh, Williams Pipeline that's being uh, done in the southern part of the state. The Constitution Pipeline is also a Williams Company, you know, parcel uh, project. Um, they have literally spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to lobby the state legislature to promote increased use of natural gas, to promote fracking. Uh, and the state Vicki Fuller uh, actually invested $160 million into, the, into this company. And so, you know, she leads the fight against investment, protecting, you know, the cash flow into the uh, fossil fuel companies. And when she leaves, you know, she immediately gets a, a uh, you know, high paid position on the board. And apparently Tom DiNapoli, the state controller, doesn't think that's a problem. Now, I, I know some people are probably saying, this is all good. Where do we find out the information about it? I see a lot of websites. Uh, there's the Green Education Legal Fund New York, gelfny.org. I subscribe, you know, even on Twitter to things like uh, Climate News, and they'll send you a couple of news uh, updates uh, a day. Uh, but there's a, Climate Reality is another one. There's a lot of good information out there that people can find. But you got to be careful. I mean, we're in a situation where the Democratic Party just opened their coffers to the fossil fuel companies. The person in charge of investing and resisting the demand for divestment just took a job that Mark was just describing with one of the biggest frack gas pipeline companies in the world. And we've got so-called climate leaders, and I'm going to call them out, Bill McKibben and Josh Fox. Bill McKibben just wrote, stay away from the Green Party. Josh Fox has got a new film out. He's saying the same thing. We're the only party that's really standing for climate change. If you get you know, behind the Democrats, you're getting behind the fossil fuel companies because they're funding the Democrats. Uh, Governor Cuomo's taking a lot of money from the gas companies. So you gotta be careful. I say talk to the Green Party. Climate news is a good source of news. There's a lot of scientific information. I will say one uh, nonprofit that I really respect is Food and Water Watch because they make the demand for 100% clean energy by 2030 in this state. They also had a big uh, role in getting the New, the U.S. off bill that's before Congress, that's 100% clean energy by 2035. Uh, that's the best we got in Congress. But anyway, that's a good group. But be careful, because there are a lot of people out there that are steering people back into the people that got us into this mess. Let's remember, the Democrats, uh, when they came back from Kyoto after watering it down, Al Gore and Bill Clinton never sent the treaty to the Senate. They never fought for it. And we just had this New York Times article about how in the late 80s, there was an opportunity to do like we did with the Montreal Protocols for ozone, to do the same thing with climate change. And, and the idea that we should go back into the Democratic Party expecting change uh, on the climate front is, you know, a suicide path. So, okay, I got that off my chest. Uh, and then the next question is, how should Greens talk to neighbors and friends about climate change, the Green New Deal, and a just transition? Uh, well, I think you really should talk to your neighbors. One-on-one -on -one is the way we move people. I mean, we can put ads on TV, we can do live stream, we can tweet, we can social media, Facebook, and so forth. 
But the literature, you know, the political scientists have studied this shows that if you talk one on one and have a real conversation, and a lot of times you don't tell them what you're thinking, you ask them what their issues are. And as you build a relationship, then you can get into the question of climate action and why it is relevant to all of us. And, you know, we call for a Green New Deal, which is not just clean energy. It's everybody ought to have the right to a living wage job, or if they can't work, an income above poverty, guaranteed by the government, comprehensive health care, a decent home, a great education. These are things that ought to be human rights. And we call it a Green New Deal because we've got to deal with the ecological crisis as well. And, you know, you can have a conversation, but the main thing is get out, talk to people, get their contact info so you can stay in touch and begin a discussion. And uh, that's how lots of us doing that is how movements start and we move people to our position. Maybe, Helen, if you don't have too much time left, how does, for instance, fixing the New York City subway system relate to climate change? Well, it's fossil fuel burning. Uh, by automobiles and trucks that is a big contributor to climate change, to the greenhouse gases being emitted. Here in New York City, it's a big contributor to ill health. I mean, the asthma and lung disease capital of the world is the Bronx because of all those trucks on those highways and those uh, uh, places where the trucks pick up or deliver uh, goods and, and, well, goods and food and so forth. So, this is an issue that concerns all of us. And we got a subway system that's been underinvested in for decades. And this is part of the whole thing that started with Reagan and Mario Cuomo was governor, did the same thing here. Austerity budgets, they don't invest in our infrastructure, it's crumbling. Now, more often than not, you're late when you get on the subways, it's inexcusable. And uh, so we're having a news conference actually tomorrow outside uh, Union Station which got up to 104 degrees. I mean, the stations are sometimes not very comfortable uh, last week. And uh, we're gonna talk about, we need 100. 10, 10.30 a.m., I believe? Yeah, 10.30 a.m. by the Gandhi statue near the entrance um, at the uh, Union Square. And we're talking about $100 billion over the next decade or so. The, the Biford Fast Forward Plan calls for 30, 38 billion over the next 10 years to get the signals and switches fixed to make some improvement to the stations. The Regional Plan Association says it'll take 62 billion to extend the subways and mass transit to the transit deserts in New York City. And then we've also got to expand citywide. So we're gonna talk about how we're gonna have ecological taxes and taxing the rich to fund that massive capital investment. You know, one thing I'll point out is that the governor talks almost exclusively about trying to deal with electricity and going slowly to renewable energy. We only get 4% of our electricity now from wind and, and solar. We wanna to go to 100%, but electricity only counts for about 25% of the state's carbon footprint. The two big things are transportation and heating and cooling buildings, both of which are about 35 to 40%. So yes, we got to move quicker to uh, produce our electricity by renewable energy, but that's why the subways are so important. And more people ride the New York City subway basically than you know almost the rest of the country is how how, how big it is. And we we got to get people out of the cars. So that's why if people want to join us tomorrow at ten thirty, that you know that would um, you know be great. Um, probably go to your website and check out a little bit more information. Yeah, we will post the uh, news release from that news conference uh, right after the news conference on the website. Uh, you can go to the website and find out where we stand on all the issues, um, particularly on climate change. Uh, you can go there, you can donate, you can volunteer. Uh, we really got to get organized because uh, let me just say this, the climate crisis we've described, and it's very serious. Uh, I think what's pinching most people the most is the rent is too damn high and healthcare costs are going through the roof while our wages are not even stagnant. They've declined over the last decade since the Great Recession. People are having trouble paying their bills and staying in their homes. And we got politicians that don't ride the subways. They don't know what we're going through. And we need, we need to clean house and get some new people in there. So I hope you all will uh, join us and uh, 
you know, there are more of us than there are of the elites. And if we get together, we can beat them. If you haven't run into Tom DiNapoli out in the street someday, tell him we want him to divest from fossil fuels. And remember to vote for Howie Harkins for governor this November. And Mark Dunley for state comptroller. Thank you.